use of normal transport in quantum many body systems. Uh, today's talk is about how uh, one dimensional quantum systems can confound these expectations. Um, now, it would be too simplistic to say that classically anomalous transport can't arise. In fact, there are several well known mechanisms for how it does arise in classical systems. Uh, so, um, two classic ways to realize anomalous transport are through um, uh, PDEs, deterministic PDEs. Uh, so examples of the fractional diffusion equation, uh, which can be viewed as an appropriate scaling limit of, of non-Brownian walks. Another example is nonlinear diffusion of a kind that arises from averaging the Navier-Stokes equations. And actually both of these uh, PDEs exhibit anomalous scaling that's neither diffusive nor ballistic. Um, a different way to get anomalous transport is through fluctuation denominated phenomena. And this is enhanced in low dimensions. Uh, so, so this, um, the recent understanding of this is kind of phenomenon goes by the name of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics uh, due to Van Byron and Schoen. And the basic idea is captured by a stochastic Burgess equation uh, in one dimension, which exhibits anomalous space time scaling. Uh, so I'll be talking in more detail about uh, two of these examples later on. Um, now, the, the last 10 years have seen an explosion of interest in anomalous transport in 1D quantum systems, uh, motivated both by access to better 1D experiments, as well as uh, numerical advances, for example, the DMRG. Um, so a well-known example of subdiffusion is, is approaching the MBL transition from the ergodic side. I won't talk about that today, but you can read about it in a recent review article. Um, the focus of today's talk will be super diffusion. Uh, so, so some recent examples in one dimensional metals at low temperature, uh, you find a kind of anomalous nonlinear diffusion of heat with a super diffusive spreading exponent. In isotropic quantum magnets, uh, you see integrability protected super diffusion in the KPZ class. This is characterized by a fixed a uh, universal two-thirds exponent. And a very recent example is an exotic possibility in, of uh, three-quarter scaling in the easy plane XXV model that originates from having an infinite number of quasi-particle flavors. Uh, so these are some diverse mechanisms for anomalous transport in 1D quantum systems. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on, on two of the super diffusive examples, namely nonlinear diffusion in metals and uh, KPZ physics and spin chain. Uh, so, so I'm going to argue that interacting one-dimensional metals that uh, are thermalizing in all other respects, uh, such as level statistics and charge transport, uh, can exhibit super diffusion of heat at low temperatures. Uh, and unlike some of the integrable examples, this type of super diffusion actually persists at long times in non-integral models and should therefore be observable in realistic experiments on quantum wires. And this is an unexpected violation of Fourier's law uh, in a well-studied class of physical systems. Um, so uh, recall that one-dimensional metals are described by perturbed Luttinger liquids. So ideal 1D metals um, are described by the free Luttinger theory, which has divergent linear response transport coefficients because it's integrable and exhibits ballistic transport. Um, the unperturbed Hamiltonian is just free bosons. Uh, by contrast, realistic 1D metals have finite transport coefficients because there are interactions or disorder that lead to scattering and to diffusion. And typical 1D interactions the most interesting kind are the density wave instabilities, which show up as irrelevant vertex operators. Now, a microscopic realization of this kind of physics that's easy to simulate is the XXE model in a staggered field. So the staggered field breaks integrability and drives you to a Luttinger liquid phase, uh, no matter how small the perturbation. And the low energy field theory has exactly this form we just described of uh, free bosons uh, with an irrelevant perturbation. 
And previous work by Hoang, Karash, and Moore numerically verified that this model was non-integrable, and moreover that the charge transport was diffusive with an exponent they could extract that was in agreement with these very old analytical results uh, for this model. So we wanted to try to uh, extend this analysis uh, to the problem of heat transport in these systems. Um, now, unfortunately, the thermal conductivity is not accessible analytically in these models. The, the exact arguments that give you the power law scaling for the charge conductivity simply don't apply. And moreover, it seems impossible to access the exponent numerically. Uh, nevertheless, a minimal assumption is that it behaves like a power law. Very naively, you can justify this from uh, Wiedem and Franz scaling. That there's no reason why Wiedem and Franz scaling should hold in general, but this power law assumption still has predictive power, and that's what we're going to test. Um, and, the, and the predictive power arises because uh, it implies that the energy density should satisfy a fast diffusion equation. So this is the type of nonlinear diffusion whose um, fundamental solutions exhibit super diffusive space time scaling. Um, and these, the fundamental solutions are so-called barren black paddle profiles. Uh, so to test this, uh, we simulated the staggered field XXZ model with a localized Gaussian wave packet initial condition. And, and a handy diagnostic for, for, the, for this transport exponent is simply the, given by the logarithmic derivatives of the wave packet moment. And a non-trivial prediction of this uh, anomalous diffusion model is power law collapse. In other words, these should converge to the same super diffusive exponent. Um, and the constraints on the, on the conductivity exponent actually mean this uh, exponent has to be greater than two thirds. Um, now, of course, this is uh, if you start with a linear response equation, a nonlinear equation, and look at its linear response, for any non zero bulk temperature, there will be a crossover time. Uh, so the limit of perfect superdiffusion is when you have expansion into a brown state. Um, that's just a, a consistency point. It wasn't really accessible in the numerics, this time scale, but in principle, it's there. And when we simulated this for, for a low bulk temperature, we, we saw clear super diffusive rather than diffusive spreading of, of wave packets. Uh, so figure one shows, um, shows the spreading of a Gaussian in time. Uh, 1A is uh, diffusive scaling, 1B is super diffusive scaling. And you see that the, the super diffusive collapse is much better. And moreover, looking at the moments in 1C, it's clear that the, the actual scaling is not neither ballistic nor diffusive, it's something in between. And, and this is precisely the prediction of the simple nonlinear diffusion model. Uh, furthermore, there seems to be some degree of universality in the long time scaling of the wave packets. This is what's shown on the right hand side. Um, interestingly, the scaling form is not consistent with the, with the simple uh, nonlinear PDE I wrote down earlier. The barren black paddle profile is monotonic away from the center point, whereas you have this interesting doubly peaked structure. And we believe this is because at short times, uh, the wave packet spreads faster than it can thermalize. Um, so it would be interesting to explore in future whether some modifications of GHD or some proximate integrability in the system could, could explain what we're seeing. Uh, so that concludes the first part of my talk and brings me to KPZ and isotropic magnets. Now, this is a phenomenon which is uh, various signatures of which have been observed for, for nearly 10 years. Um, and, and what it amounts to is a, what you could call integrability protected KPZ physics in 1D magnets with isotropic symmetry. And this is typically diagnosed through the long time behavior of the spin autocorrelation function at finite temperature and zero magnetization. Uh, what you see is a two thirds exponent for integral models, 
and what seemed to be a one-half exponent for non-integral models, although Jacopo is going to explain uh, what actually happens in non-integral models. Um, and this essential, this basic picture has been verified in many numerical studies. I'm just uh, citing a recent selection on this slide, as many as would fit. Um, but uh, until recently, this interesting phenomenon was essentially unexplained. So the closest approach to uh, a theoretical explanation for the two thirds was a self-consistent uh, derivation by Homan Serang, which is a uh, which has since been extended in important ways, uh, that was based on generalized hydrodynamics. So previously, there, there were three fundamental questions about this phenomenon that hadn't been addressed. Uh, the, the most glaring one was why the same phenomenon occurs for both quantum and classical systems. Um, the second question, hinting at some kind of universality, uh, was why are both integrability and isotropic symmetry necessary for this phenomenon uh, to be stable at long times? And maybe worth noting, it's not just isotropic symmetry. It's, it's any, it seems that any internal non-abelian Lie group symmetry is actually sufficient. So, so there is a universal character to this phenomenon that needs explaining. Uh, and finally, why is the collapse to universal KPZ scaling functions observed numerically? Uh, now, it's worth pointing out that the evidence for this is much better in the classical case than the quantum case. This could be a matter of time scales, or it could be pointing at something deeper. I think it's fair to say that that's not clear yet. Uh, but the bottom line was that these questions reflected a basic lack of understanding of what was causing this phenomenon. Um, so, so recently we proposed an explanation uh, based on what you can think of as of goldstone modes of GHD. Uh, they're, they're, soft, they're soft modes of the magnetization um, that arise in certain local equilibrium states and are missed by standard hydrodynamic approaches. Uh, now I want, want to be careful when I say that. Um, what I mean is that a naive application of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, uh, as detailed in the review article by Schwone, um, predicts um, simply diffusive spreading. Similarly, a naive application of GHD with a short wavelength cutoff in place also predicts purely diffusive spreading. So it seems there's some ingredient missing from, from these standard theories and, um, and I'm going to argue that this ingredient is precisely these long wavelength coherent excitations of spin. Uh, in particular, these modes have a nonlinear self coupling and are separated in scale from these short wavelength hydrodynamic theories, which allows for a channel for super diffusive spin transport. Um, and this, the physical mechanism giving rise to this of these. Uh, long wavelength excitations coupled to a short wavelength quasi-particle bar is actually very similar to a, to a mechanism which arose in a completely different context, uh, namely 1D Bose gases. Um, so the figure is a schematic illustration of uh, on the one, these long wavelength coherent excitations on the left and the short wavelength uh, fluctuating spins on the, on the short length scale L. Um, so how do these modes arise? Well, it's helpful to consider the simplest integral model with quantum integral model with SE2 symmetry that's, that's on a line, namely the spin half Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And as I'm sure everyone in this audience knows, Beta's ansatz to solve this model builds eigenstates out of spin waves on a pseudo vacuum. So this is a reference state that's typically a product of uh, highest weight states in your representation. And once you fix this, you, you, you forget about it, you build everything on top of it. Um, now something happen interesting happens when you have an internal Lie group symmetry. So say SU2 is in the case of Heisenberg, um, the direction of the pseudo vacuum inherits this symmetry. I can take an arbitrary direction on the sphere and build my excitations on top of that, and I've solved the model. 
by contrast, when you have an applied field, not all of these directions are allowed. Only pseudo vacuum directions parallel to the field yield a set of eigenstates. And this property of the beta ansatz is, is actually expressed in the TBA. So, for example, the, the average of the magnetization has to lie along the pseudo vacuum. Um, now, what this property means at the level of hydrodynamics is uh, there's a surprising inversion. So, in the sense that if I, if I coarse grain my system into a bunch of fluid cells and one of them spontaneously forms a local magnetization, over the course of some hydrodynamic flow, then I've spontaneously broken the SU2 symmetry. In other words, I've picked a pseudo vacuum and I now ought to regard the pseudo vacuum as a dynamical degree of freedom. Um, my personal view is that this vector degree of freedom is still missing from GHD, that there ought to be some way, perhaps analogous to the Fermi liquid theory of spin half electrons, of keeping track of this vector degree of freedom. Uh, but failing that, one can write down um, an effective long wavelength dynamics for the pseudo vacuum. So, so one should consider states which are homogeneous on the short wavelength quasi particle scale, but exhibit long wavelength fluctuations of this vacuum and their effective Hamiltonian dynamics projected onto the vacuum sector. Is, is simply the landau lifshitz equation. So then you can ask, okay, so there's this nonlinear degree of freedom apparently missing from, from GHD. Does it give rise to the observed KPZ scaling? And, and when you try to formulate the fluctuating hydrodynamics, you find plausibly it does. So since I'm running low on time, I'll just sketch the, the derivation. The key technical point is to eliminate this SU2 invariance, this arbitrariness in parametrizing the spin vector. So a nice trick to do that, which I learned about from a paper from the 70s, but is a century older, as uh, Jacopo and collaborators uh, pointed out, um, you can regard this spin as the tangent vector to a fictitious space curve. And the Frenet array equations for this curve essentially remove the gauge ambiguity in choosing this frame. And they give you natural invariant coordinates, which are known as the curvature and the torsion. Uh, now, there are various ways to argue that the curvature dynamics is irrelevant. I don't think, I think it's fair to say there's not a consensus there, but what you're left with is uh, a single stochastic Burgess equation for the torsion. Um, and from this, it follows that, that KPZ scaling is natural to expect. Uh, so, so just a comment about why the, why the curvature drops out. It's the, this is soft mode dynamics, so the energy could be expected to be negligible. Um, finally, just a comment on why this should be integrability protected. Uh, well, the key difference lies in the nature of the scalar bath, so the nature of the hydrodynamics of the short length scale. And in non-integrable models, there are only two scalar modes per fluid cell. So the variance of the scalar bar scales sub-extensively as I increase my fluid cells. And what this means is the distinction between uh, fluctuating short wavelength modes and coherent long wavelength modes becomes, uh, disappears at long wavelength. So, so this is a claim that the non-linearity becomes irrelevant. As you'll hear in the next talk, the decay actually renders the nonlinearity marginally irrelevant. Uh, but by contrast, in integral models, this variance doesn't decay. One continues to have fluctuations of order one as the fluid cell is scaled up. And, and this is one way to see why, um, why integrability protects KPZ physics in this case. Uh, so I'd just like to, to summarize some subsequent developments. Uh, this, this effective picture of a soft gauge mode being responsible for KPZ has been tested reasonably thoroughly at this point, given a microscopic justification uh, in the sense that solitons are the only thing, it's been shown that landau lifshitz solitons are the only thing that could be giving rise to this physics, um, and successfully applied to the Hubbard model in a paper which did a lot of other things. 
uh, an exciting goal going forward would be to extend this idea to understand super universality, namely the observation of the same physics for higher internal symmetry groups. Very naively, they all contain an SU2 subgroup, so you could say, well, that's what's happening, but it would be good to clarify that further. Uh, so with that, thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Mir. Um, so we have, yeah, we have some time for questions. You have a question, just unmute yourself. Jacobo, is that, wait, no, I, I saw a raised hand, okay. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about this super universality. I don't know these papers which were cited here, but so what is the claim that the symmetry group does not influence the scaling uh, exponent or what? It, it appears that you get a two thirds for, yes. In brief, yes. I think it's been numerically checked for examples like SUN and SO5, uh, but it seems that they're KPZ in all cases. So when you think about Goldstone modes, then of course, if you have a bigger symmetry group, then there are, you have more directions uh, where yep. to make excitations. Yep. So I will, I'm a bit surprised by this, that it does not enter at all. So I, I can speculate on why. It may be that the, so, so yeah, the Sang Roman, uh, others uh, gave arguments for why these higher order couplings can be irrelevant. I think something similar might be happening here, that the, there are these higher modes, but they may be irrelevant in a scaling sense. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, okay, maybe so maybe I have one question. So sure. you mentioned that each of these higher groups contain an SU2 subgroup. So then essentially yeah. what, what if this picture would to behold, you'd essentially need to somehow get an effective decoupling of the SC2 sectors on this hard Quite, 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 quite possibly. Um, but it would be nice to make that rigorous and say that this cohomology class really leads to uh, this nonlinear coupling. In, uh, okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. So weird, but these exponents, these weird exponents you get, uh, Loti, could it be that again it's a uh, it's log correction because there is some uh, no because your perturbation is relevant, right? So it's not mildly relevant, or at least that's. The uh, oh, you mean you mean it for the Luttinger liquid? No. Uh, I think it's it is dangerously irrelevant. It's an irrelevant perturbation that's changing the the class of the dynamics. But I think the me the mechanism is quite different from what's happening in your case. That the physical picture is just a, yeah, because it's nonlinear diffusion rather than a, a fluctuation effect that's changing. But still, you have no way to predict these exponents. So, far. Uh, so one could try, so that the problem is there's no exact argument. With the charge conductivity, it, it's a very rigorous calculation. It's the self energy. And if you want to look at the thermal conductivity, there's some stuff with the memory matrix. But as far as I know, this is not on the same rigorous footing as these Dyson series type arguments. Uh, so I don't know a good way to get that exponent. But maybe show with a lower bound that it's uh, okay. It's a hard. Mm. Uh, yeah, maybe worth adding that even if you don't know the exponent, it, it's the divergence that's important. Uh, simply the fact that it diverges at low temperature will give you some kind of super diffusion. So I, I had a question about the first part of your talk. This is Robert Connick. You uh, mentioned hi. The, hi. So you mentioned the possibility of actually seeing the super diffusion in generic 1D wires. And I was yeah. I was wondering, uh, 
will will phonons or any how protected is this phenomena against phonons or disorder or have you thought about um it? so we think it's it's reasonably robust to so for example even in this simple case of xxz with a staggered field as the Luttinger liquid, you have several kinds of irrelevant perturbation like fan curvature and uh, even the umclap scattering. Uh, we haven't studied in detail what happens with uh, more irrelevant terms, but we would expect that as long as there is a dominant irrelevant term, there should be a, a clear superdiffusion. That, um... Okay. Any other question? So maybe I can ask one. So can you comment a bit on the numerical sure. evidence for KPZ? I mean, they are like, especially in the quantum case, like not all profiles that you get from DMRGs match KPZ especially well in all cases and in yeah. particular with, you know, different symmetries. So yeah, do you have any thought on this? I mean, it could be very well um, done. On the, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so maybe, so the classical evidence seems to be reasonably convincing, and all of the theory points to the fact that the underlying mechanism is classical. So it's the same between spin half XXZ and classical Landau lift ships, namely these uh, long wavelength coherent modes. But as, as, you're, as you mentioned, that the numerical evidence on the quantum side really isn't very convincing for, for good bond dimensions and the, the tails don't collapse very well. Uh, and it's, it's not yet clear, I think, whether this is a, a transient on the way to better agreement or whether there's genuinely a different scaling function that comes about from a more careful treatment of the fluctuating hydrodynamics. Uh, yeah, all right. thanks. Um, all right, so if there's no more question, I suggest we thank Pierre.